All right, I'm going to invite my dad up. His name's Stan. Uh, I grew up calling him Pastor Dad a little bit. Me and my six siblings. Um, my mom's over here as well, but she's not going to come up here. I guarantee that. So, um, But I remember... Uh, when I was going into first grade, my family moved from Fairmont, Minnesota, where, where my parents grew up, um, and we moved to Cambridge, Minnesota, where my dad went into the ministry as a pastor at a little church called Dale Free Church, and um, a lot of people, I think, thought Dale was the name of the pastor, and our, we lived in the, the parsonage right next to the house, which would be like that house right over there, and so we were, as little kids, were trained to answer the phone, hi, Dale Free Church, you know. <laughs> Oh, hi, Grandma, you know. So, um, but we lived there for, for almost five years, then moved to be a part of a church plant called Cornerstone Free Church in Owatonna. And then when I was in high school, we moved to um, northern Iowa. And my parents have been in Iowa ever since. And I was in Iowa until I came here to Cocado with my family. So super pumped because I was thinking, I was like, when's the last time we've done this on a Sunday? We got to minister and serve together. And just because you're in ministry and I'm in ministry. We've done like, you know, Christmas or Thanksgiving or uh, Good Friday services, but I, don't, I couldn't remember one that we've done on a Sunday morning. So super excited that this worked out. So I'm going to pray, and then I'll hand it over to you. All right, Pops? Awesome. All right. Uh, Lord God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for meeting with us and caring for us and loving us and uh, just meeting us right where we're at. God, and we pray that you, and I trust that you're going to do that this morning as we hear from Pastor Stan, my dad, um, that you will just speak through him in power as he shares your word, God, that we would walk out of this place uh, more in awe of your love for us, more in awe of your plan for us, and just seeking to walk in steps of obedience with you. So we give this time to you. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Andy. Well, good morning, Living Stones Church. I asked Andy, do you guys do amens? And he said, you're so polite, if I ask for one, you'll probably give one. Amen? Amen. <laughs> As a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's my privilege and my honor to be here with you this morning. Um, also, I'm honored not just because I'm Andy's dad, but I'm the father of a grandfather, Chris and I are grandparents, of four awesome kids who call this church home. And uh, there they are. I, I'm especially proud of that picture on the left. Uh, we served for a couple of years in, in Iowa Falls, and one day Owen and Emron went out adventuring with Grandpa, and, and I thought, that looks like they're trying to be musicians like their dad kind of, doesn't it? Anyway, if you have your Bible with you, and uh, I know some of you are going to be using your apps, uh, I'm going to invite you to turn to Matthew 28 and 16. Uh, Chris and I, as you do that, we want to say thank you for the different ways that you've loved and encouraged Andy and Austin, and helped them feel so much a part of this church family from the day you moved them here. And we're excited about what God is doing in and through your congregation. Um, I asked Andy before the service, taking a look at things, and I saw how close this front row of chairs is. And I said, do people, are they going to sit up there? And he said, well, probably not this Sunday, but next week when we're celebrating some baptisms and child dedications, there, there might be some people in the front row. And I said, I've never had anybody sit this close to me when I was preaching except my uncle's funeral in New York Mills. Anybody know New York Mills? That's a very finished town. And I know like yours, you're the sauna capital of the world, right? But sauna. Yeah, sauna. Oh, did I say it wrong? Sauna. Anyway. Anyway, I, I did my uncle's funeral, and I was this close to the front row. Uh, and uh, I was amazed. My uncle, my mom, my grandparents all had parts of their service at that funeral home. And since it's a real finished town, what did that funeral home have? A sauna. Do, are, is there one in Cocado in the funeral home? No, I mean, <laughs> anyway, anyway. Uh, Chris and I wanted to get up here to Cocada before school started, and I'm very grateful my church gave me that opportunity. Uh, I'm sure like most Minnesotans, you have enjoyed a little bit of vacation time this summer. I know between Memorial Day and Labor Day, uh, lots of people try to get away, often up north. Anybody go up north this summer? 
And um, when our kids were little, we did a lot of camping. Usually the whole family together, we had a, a school bus that was converted to a camper, and then we got another school bus, and then we got another school bus converted to a camper, and enjoyed a lot of those times together. But um, when Andy and Tony were a little bit older than, the, well, probably this was 20 years ago or so, we went on a two or three day adventure up to the North Shore, and it was beautiful. We had a lot of fun, we brought our bicycles with, but we made a stop along the way. We went through the Iron Range, uh, State Park, uh, Lake Vermilion, and there they have an underground mine. And uh, we decided, hey, we're not in a hurry, we're gonna go on a tour of that mine. And so we got our tickets and um, waited in line, got in the elevator shaft and started going down and down and down. And each, anybody been on that tour? Each floor we passed, at least most of them, it seemed like when we got to a floor, we'd see a bunch of bats hanging upside down looking at us as we went lower and lower and lower into the earth. It kind of felt like we were going into a mountain, but we weren't. I mean, up, up on the uh, ground level, it was pretty flat. We were going into the earth, and we got down a long ways, and the elevator stopped, and we got out, and we started walking down that passageway. You see those train tracks, and walked down, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 yards, whatever it was, and we got into a big room about as large as your sanctuary, and the tour guide started telling us about what work was like in that iron mining town 100, 120, 130 years ago. Immigrants were coming from all over the world seeking to provide a better way for their family. And in that mine, they would get teams of four men together. Interestingly, None of the four spoke the same language. They did that on purpose. You know, you're not going to waste time talking to each other. So you might have a Greek and a Bulgarian and an Irishman and a Finn on that work team. And the responsibilities, three of the men were given a sledgehammer, and the fourth man, a steel spike that he would put on the piece of ore that they were hoping to extract. So one guy would hold the spike, and the other three would take turns slamming their sledgehammer down upon that spike so they could get the ore out of the earth and bring it back to the surface. Now I said again, they didn't speak the same language. So you had to learn in a hurry. How do you say stop or wait or ouch, that hurt, in, in ways they could understand. Anyway, as they, they told us about this, the, the room was lit up nicely just like this. They said, we want to give you an idea of what it was like 120 years ago. We didn't have all this technology and all these lights. In fact, the workers back then, they'd wear a stocking cap under the ground and there was a little clip on their stocking cap for a candle. So you'd have three guys with a candle working with their sledgehammers. And uh, she said, just for a moment, we're going to let you see what it would be like when all the lights were off. And we waited. And they turned the light off, and it was darker and blacker than anything I'd ever been a part of. It was almost as though you could feel the darkness. And they told us back 120 years ago, there were many men who, in the wintertime especially, they'd go to the mine in the morning while it was still dark. They'd work all day, come up out of that mine to go home to their wife and children. It'd already be dark. They'd been underneath the ground all that time when the sun was shining. And, and I got to think, I don't know how I could have done in that environment. I mean, those guys, most all of them, were very, very thankful for the opportunity to provide a better life for their families. And yet many of them struggled emotionally, spiritually, physically, hard, difficult work. We got up out of the ground, that elevator shaft, I don't know if I've ever been happier to see daylight. <laughs> and, I, and I was giving thanks to God for the opportunity you and I have to have choices, right? You and I can make all sorts of decisions about where we want to live and what kind of work we want to do. But even better than being able to choose the kind of work that, that we do or the place where you're going to live 
you and I are incredibly blessed, and I hope you hear this, to be able to choose the kind of life that God wants each one of us to live. Amen? Okay, Andy, you said they'd say it. Amen? Amen. There we go. Got to keep me going. By the way, if you ever get a pastor you're not sure you want to keep anymore, I've heard this helpful advice. Start saying amen every other minute, and the poor guy will preach himself to death. Okay? Okay. I'm glad we can look to this book today. I sometimes call this our instruction manual. If you take that word Bible apart, you could say basic instruction before leaving earth. And in this book, our Savior has given us specific instructions, not only on the kind of people he wants us to be, he's also given us some incredible great words of wisdom to help us understand exactly how you and I can live the kind of life that honors Jesus. Last Sunday morning, the treasurer of our church made me very happy. He tracked me down to hand me my paycheck. I was excited because now I knew we could go on vacation. Anyway, I wasn't able to use that paycheck until I first did something with it. I had to endorse it and deposit it, right? And that's kind of what the Word of God is like. This book is full of promises, and each one of these promises is like a check. It's not going to do you any good until you acknowledge that it's made out to you and has given to, been given to you by the God of all creation. And then you need to cash it. And how do we do that? Uh, largely by believing and obeying it. And this morning, we're going to look at one of the most well-known passages in the Bible. We're actually going to start at the very end of Matthew 28, and we're going to point by point make our way to the beginning of the Great Commission. And in the very last sentence of this gospel, Jesus told us a very great and precious promise, one he wants you and I to bank on. And this is that promise, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And pretty much every time you read that word behold in your Bible is because God really, really wants you and me to pay attention. It's, it's like Jesus is telling you and me and everyone else who's ever going to read these verses, I want you to listen to me very closely because I have something incredibly important you need to hear. Now what's he saying? He's saying, I am with you always. Always. Those words should be incredibly special to each and every one of us because we, we sang about it a little bit ago, it's kind of normal to have concerns about the future. Probably one of the most common concerns people have about the future is, is a fear of the unknown. So Jesus gives us his word and he says, I am with you always, always. He's telling you there's no need for you to ever feel afraid or all alone. And the cool thing, since our Jesus is God the Son, he never has to take a break from you, any one of you, in order to get some sleep or help someone or go on vacation. No, our God is our ever-present help in trouble. I haven't done the math, but someone who enjoys counting these things says he's discovered that God has said, do not be afraid, or something very similar, 365 different times. Now, why would God do that? Why? It's because he does not want you to be afraid. He doesn't want you to fear anything or anyone other than him. And for some of you, that part might be a little bit confusing, so I want to explain what it means to fear God. What it means to fear God is to show your respect for him by seeking to please him. That make sense? It's like a mom and dad love it when their kids have that kind of reverence or fear, respect for them. Show your respect for God by seeking to please him. You get that right, and lots of other things are going to fall into place. And Psalm 111, verse 10, tells us why. Can you read that with me? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
all those who practice it have a good understanding. And that's something for which we can praise God, right? Before we go any further, though, I should let you know that most of the promises that are here in God's word are not for everyone. Did you know that? They're not for everyone. They're only for those who belong to him. And you know, pretty much everyone on the planet wants to belong, wants to be loved. And, and more than anyone else you're ever going to meet, Jesus desires not only to love you, but to be on the receiving end of your love. The church that Austin grew up in, that our friends Glenn and Suzanne are still a part of, uh, the Iwana director in that church, he used to, Ray, he used to stand up sometimes on Sunday morning and remind the whole church family, God does not have any grandchildren, right? God doesn't have any grandchildren, only kids. We all come to the Lord the same way, one at a time. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. You see, it doesn't matter if you've been a part of this church family since the first Sunday you were born, like our grandson Jones, right? It doesn't matter if your dad's been on the church board, if your mom is a faithful Sunday school teacher, or you've memorized every single lantern music song that's ever been recorded. And these are all great, right? But you need to belong to and follow Jesus if you're going to personally be on the receiving end of any of his great and precious promises. And right here at the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus is talking to his followers. He's speaking to men and women and young people who understand and embrace the gospel, who, who know that when the sinless and holy Son of God went to the cross. He was choosing to die in their place for their sins, saving them and all who would place their faith in him from the just and holy condemnation we each deserve. We all ought to be able to often say, praise God, salvation is a gift. Amen? Amen. But it's a gift you need to receive in faith. In faith. Now, a uh, question for you. How many of you like math? It's usually a minority of the people. <laughs> Chris's dad was a math teacher. Did you notice she didn't raise her hand? <laughs> We're going to see some of you this might be review. But we're going to see something in Scripture that is referred to as a salvation equation. We're going to put this up on, yeah, it's up there, John 1 and 12. Read that with me, church. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So that equation is in there. Do you see it? We're going to show it to you. This is Bible math. Let's go to that next slide. Believe plus receive equals what? Become. And if you've yet to become one of God's children, let this be the day of your salvation. The day you choose to admit you're a sinner, you deserve God's judgment, humbly turning from your sins and placing your faith in Jesus and the finished work of the cross. Okay, back to that promise at the end of Matthew's gospel. This time I want you to See it in the Amplified Version of the Bible. This is where it says, And behold, I am with you always, perpetually, uniformly, and on every occasion. I sometimes encourage the members of our church family to take Jesus with you wherever you go to be conscious of the fact that you're an ambassador, you're a representative of him, everywhere you go. And yet the reality is, if you're in Christ, if you're a blood-bought follower of God's only begotten Son, that's not necessary because Jesus says, I am with you 
always perpetually, uniformly, and on every occasion. And for most all of us, that's incredibly encouraging news. But for some of you, that might be a little bit convicting. You see, you can't have certain compartments where Jesus is allowed and other places where he can't go. He is with you always. We back up a verse or so, we're going to see that here in the Great Commission, God's only Son has also communicated his great purpose. His great purpose. Okay, Uh, we just talked about math. This one is science. What's the purpose of an apple tree? Now, if you're going to make apple pie, the answer is pretty obvious, but is that really the most correct and complete answer? Well, if you slice an apple open, what do you see on the inside? You see seeds. And what's the purpose of an apple seed? Not to make a pie. It's to make apple trees. God has designed that ability for an apple tree to reproduce itself through every apple it produces. Like produces like. Orange trees not only produce oranges, they also provide a way for other orange trees to come into existence. That makes sense, right? Easy science. So what did God design Christians to do? We see it here in the first part of verse 19. God's purpose for us as Christians is pretty much the same as it is for all the rest of his creation, for every other living thing. He says, go therefore... And make disciples of all nations. That means reproduce yourself with the help of the Holy Spirit, what he's doing in other people's lives as he draws them to him. You're to come alongside and disciple them, right? Uh, once, Once or twice a year, I give the young people in our church advice about dating. It's pretty simple. Every date is a potential mate. Say that, young people. Every date is a potential mate. So I tell them, you shouldn't ever date somebody you wouldn't one day potentially think you might want to marry. Okay, it doesn't mean you know you're going to marry them. However, I knew in sixth grade who I was going to marry. It took a long time to convince her. (laughs) And I told my own kids, I said, if you find that perfect someone in middle school or high school, don't tell them, because you're bound to do something really dumb somewhere along the uh, the way, and that person can say, why in the world would I ever be interested in you? Somehow, God graciously enabled my wife to look past those things. And I'm so thankful for that. Um, Chris and I weren't perfect parents, but we do praise the Lord for how he brought each of our kids and their spouses together. And I'll just give you, uh, for instance, Andy and Austin. Um, Austin's dad, Glenn, raise your hand, Glenn. Glenn was actually the search committee chairman of the church that Austin went to when I was called to be their pastor. And I'll say, good job, Glenn. (laughs) We were really blessed to come to that community. And if we hadn't come to that community, Andy likely wouldn't have had an opportunity to meet Austin. And they wouldn't have gotten married. And we wouldn't have been able to enjoy and celebrate these four special grandchildren that are now a part of their family. Anyway, uh, I, I knew Austin not nearly as long as I've known Andy, of course. But Austin was super active in our church and in our youth group. No surprises, right? And Austin had a spiritual concern for each and every member of her high school class. As a high school student, she cared about the kids she went to school with. And in fact, she demonstrated her love and her concern for her classmates her fellow seniors, 
by sending each one of these classmates, all the boys and girls in her class, a letter that included her testimony and an encouragement for them to respond in faith to the good news of the gospel. I love that then. I still love it now. Not, did, not only did Austin live out her faith in the classrooms and the hallways at her school, she made sure that every one of the kids in her class had a written copy of the gospel that they could keep and read and reread and refer to whenever God prompted their heart. And, and why did Austin do that, church? She, she did it because she not only has a great love for Jesus, she had a love and concern for the eternal destiny of each of her classmates. And those are the two greatest requirements for you and me if we want to see God's purposes fulfilled for us in our generation. We need to have a love for him, an overarching, he's the number one, the priority of our lives, so a love for him and a love for all those who've been created in his image. Well, as you can see, these verses in Matthew go beyond making converts. Jesus is talking, again, specifically about making disciples. And he says, as you are going, as you're going this next couple of weeks, some of the young people will be going back to school or to college or uh, a lot of you is going to work. Wherever it is, God is going to be sending you this week or this month. Jesus says, regardless of your age or stage in life, if you belong to him, you are to be making disciples. There's no place in God's kingdom for undercover Christians. Jesus does not want you to keep your faith to yourself. He wants you to share it, to be truly concerned about each person he puts in your path. One of the ways we do that is by building relationships based on trust that are strong enough to bear the weight of truth. We can plant seeds or we can water seeds that others have planted. And, and then just like a farmer, we need to leave the results to God. Next part of the command, Jesus says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I was excited to hear you guys are doing baptisms next Sunday. Next Sunday, our church is also going to be doing baptisms at one of the parks in our town. Um, our worship team isn't as loud as yours is, but we're going to have them crank it up in that park so all the neighbors know we're gathering together to make much of Jesus. And uh, I'm excited about it. Last year at our baptism service, we baptized a 73-year-old man who just a few weeks before that had gotten saved. Now, that's pretty old to get baptized, isn't it? And I didn't talk to him about it or anything. The Lord just got a hold of his heart, and he wanted to go public with his faith. Uh, this picture isn't that 73-year-old guy. Uh, this is my friend Harry. Harry looks a little older than 73, right? He's, he was 83 last summer when he got baptized. About six months before the baptism service, I visited Harry in the hospital. Harry didn't have a church family yet. Uh, he was on death's doorstep. Uh, my friend was under 100 pounds. And um, uh, he didn't know, we didn't know if he was going to make it. After he got out of the hospital... He was very interested in doing a Bible study that would help you know for sure where you're going to spend eternity. Two groups of people are often most open to the gospel, people who are experiencing tension in their life or people who are going through transitions. Harry's wife had, had just recently died, and he was sick. And I have videos of him in his kitchen, dining room table, right where he's seated here, bearing witness with his own lips of how good it is to belong to Jesus. Um, we got him a king-size, large, giant print Bible. Um, he... The, I gave it to him a week later. He's like on Genesis 28. He says, Pastor, this is good. He says, this is better than the TV. And he said, you know what? Those people weren't very nice to each other a lot of times. 
And it was just exciting. Anyway, as, as it came closer to the baptism service, and we had done a discipleship study after he came to faith in Christ, um, Harry was the first person to let me know he wanted to get baptized. Again, 83 years old. He didn't say, ooh, I, I wish I would have come to Christ when I was younger. No, he wanted to do it. And one thing I didn't tell you, he had a feeding tube in his stomach. Uh, I, I told Harry I was going to share this story with you this morning, but three or four times a day he had to put a bottle of Ensure into this tube in his stomach to get his weight back up. A few months ago, he had that tube removed, but last summer when he was baptized, he had that, that tube in his stomach. And I was so blessed that Harry chose to believe and obey God's word. You guys have heard it countless Sundays. Baptism isn't an option. In fact, Jesus commanded it. It's one of the ways you bear witness to your faith in the risen Christ. And if you're interested in being baptized after the service or you just want to know more, talk to Andy or one of the elders. They'll help you understand why it's important and how it's going to happen. Baptism is, was, and always will be a part of the, a big part of the great commission, part of Christ's purposes for us who are following him. But there's something else pretty important we dare not neglect. Part of making disciples, verse 20, Jesus says is teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And that's a big part of why you come here on Sunday mornings and during the school year, why you meet in, in homes and why the youth group comes together on Wednesday nights, why you have Sunday school. I headed off to college a little more than four decades ago. That makes me feel kind of old. It also makes me feel pretty special because we didn't know our friends, Greg and Lynette, who were part of the church family that we were in when I got baptized as a young man in Christ, were part of that school. I went to Mankato State, and I knew I wanted to be a journalist. I knew I'd be hearing lots of things at that school that sounded incredibly good and attractive, taught by people. Uh, professors who were passionate about what they were teaching. And, and I said to myself, I don't want to fall for whatever they're going to share with me. I want to make sure I sift all of that through God's word so I'm not deceived, so I'm not led astray, so I don't drift away from the faith. And one of the things I did that summer before I left home, I memorized 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Do I have a slide for that one? All scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So I was 18 years old. I memorized that. I, I love the Bible. I love the youth group I was a part of. I love the church I was a part of. But as I was going to school, I, need, I knew I needed to surround myself with other like-minded people. I knew I had to spend time in the Word of God. I made a daily appointment. A lot of people do it in the morning. When I was in college, it was easier to do it last thing of the day. And then as I would go to sleep, I'd have God's word here and here. Encourage you to have a, a time and a place. Memorize scripture. Ephesians chapter 6. We emphasized that to our kids in Bible school this last couple weeks ago. The only offensive weapon in the armor of God is the sword. His word, which we need to hide in his heart. A lot more I could say on that, but I notice we're ticking up towards the top of the hour. Um, one of Andy's younger brothers goes to our church, and, and, uh, and when I told him that Andy's expectation is I'd be done in 25 or 30 minutes, he said, Dad, you're barely going to be getting through your introduction. <laughs> oh, well, friends... Whether you want to admit it or not, and I think most of you are glad to admit it, as a follower of Jesus Christ, he has a divine purpose for each and every one of you, and that includes making disciples. I love the fact that in God's economy, you do not need a job description or an official title 
to do the work he has called you to do. You just need to love him and love people. And some of you are saying, Pastor, that's just not the way I am. (laughs) I'd like to, but I can't be that kind of Christian. And if you're thinking that way, I've got some good news for you. Our Jesus would never ask you to do something you're incapable of doing with his help. And that's why, before he ascended into heaven, our Savior also reminded us of his unlimited power. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I, I think it's important for us to know, Jesus did not give us this great commission until after the cross, okay? And why is that significant? Well, in part because it was through his death and resurrection that Jesus conquered Satan, sin, and death. Uh, You probably remember that right after Jesus himself was baptized, the Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And, And Satan offered Jesus... As part of that temptation, all the kingdoms of the world, if he would only fall down and worship him. And yet, here, on this side of the cross, Jesus tells us he has all authority in heaven and on earth. And church, when he returns a second time, not as a sacrifice for sin, but as a conquering king... Philippians chapter 2 tells us that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, believers, those of you who are in Christ, remember these verses and the promises they contain are for all of us who claim Jesus as Savior and Lord. You have been commissioned, not by your church or your pastor or even your denomination, but by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And in his word, he's made it clear. He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. These promises already belong to you. You simply need to believe them and obey them. You need to stay connected to Christ and to the body of Christ. I'm going to have the worship team come forward and I think I've got a, a picture of, a, of an old building I want you to see. I took this picture a while back. It's the back of one of our buildings on our main street. And you see what's happened. The top of that building, there's all sorts of water damage. I'm sure it started with just a little, but as water got in the cracks and there's a cycle of freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing. Eventually what happened? A, a brick fell and then another. In fact, at the bottom of that building, there was all sorts of broken bricks hadn't yet been cleaned up. And the gaps between some of those bricks seem to be a little bit wider than others. And it makes me want to ask you a question. Could that picture you're looking at be a picture of what the devil wants to have happen at Living Stones Church? If bricks are members, they're all important. That's part of the reason why I love your your name. Every one, every stone living is important the body of Christ but if you check out a church and think no one is going to notice that picture is up there as a reminder you see what can happen every one of us who belongs to Christ has also been given a gift and when those gifts aren't used or when we're not where we need to be It can have an impact, not just on us, but on the rest of the church, your church as well. And that's why in Hebrews 10 and 25, Scripture says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us 
encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So, just a reminder, it's good to live in a time and a place where we have choices and there's no better choice than to participate with the Lord and what he's wanting to do in and through you and your family and your church family. God wants us to understand, realize we not only need him, we also need each other. Amen? His promise, I'm with you always. His purpose, go and make disciples. His power is there for you. All authority, he says, belongs to me. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for what you've shown us in this hour. Some great reminders, some important truths perhaps you've revealed to us in ways that we in the past had not yet really understood. Lord, we'll admit we're not perfect people, but we belong to a perfect God and we're humbled by the reality that you could use us to be a blessing to this church, to expand the influence of your kingdom, to bring the good news of your gospel to a people who are in desperate need of the hope that can only be ours because of your son, Jesus. Help us each believe and obey your holy word. time of desperation when all we know is doubt and fear there is only one foundation we believe we believe In this broken generation When all is dark you help us see There is only one salvation Oh we believe Oh we believe You can stand and sing this with us We believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death, we believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. We believe. faith be more than anthems, greater than the songs we sing, and in our weakness and temptations, we believe. He's giving us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And He's coming back again. Let the lost be found and the dead be raised in the here and now. Let love invade. Let the church live loud. Our God will say we believe. 
how you move us because of the truth of the gospel, how you move us to, to live in our everyday, to walk with you, to seek to spend time in your word, to spend time in your presence, and then to, to, to go fully in your power with your presence, leading, guide us, guiding us every step of the way. So Lord, we trust that you will do that now as we, we walk out these doors, as we, as we visit with one another, as we go about our week and about work and maybe moving uh, to college today up to Duluth. Oh God, you are with us each and every step of the way. Um, may we trust in that promise. May we believe in that. And uh, may you give us comfort in that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have an amazing week.